pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Reads. This is at the tail end of my Read Your Shelves reading marathon. So I'm a little, little burnt out today, but not too bad. And really excited about the upcoming week when Black Hit my Black History Month TBR kicks in. I have vlogged all of what I'm going to tell you today, except for the TBR part. And there's a separate TBR video, so I'm not going to go on and on about any of this. But I know a lot of people don't watch vlogs, so I will recap my reading adventures for the week since I last checked in on Friday, yes, last week. So I have three bales to tell you about. Two of them related to Read Your Shelves, so for me Read Your Shelves is almost always has a sizable Bail Your Shelves component. And the first one, no big surprise, was Crudo by Olivia Lang. This was awful. I bailed on page six. I'd forgotten that I read the first paragraph. Well, I usually read the first paragraph on my haul videos, and I hated the first paragraph, and that set the tone, but I did give it till page six, so I gave it an honest try. The writing was disgusting, and so was the protagonist. There was no way I was spending 100 and 130 pages with that person. That one was supposed to be for the cover by category, and so its replacement I also bailed on. <laughs> who was changed and who was dead by Barbara Commons. This is like a 1950s novel about a family in Britain and there's a flood in their house and they don't seem to notice. It kind of read like a cross between the Munsters in terms of character development and a really bad Wes Anderson movie so I wasn't caring a rat's ass about anything and bailed after about, I can't remember, 20 or 30 percent. Toast! Nice cover though. So, cover buys. Do they work? Not, not that, not this week. So I will tell, uh, I'll try to remember to tell you what the replacement cover, but no, it didn't work out very well either. <laughs> so. And not specifically related to Read Your Shells, I bailed on Don Quixote. Go me, go me. I'm so glad I read the first 10%. And then it's kind of like the Jeeves series by P.G. Woodhouse. Nothing, there's no, it's, it's the same story over and over again. It's this, it's the precursor to the sitcom. It's probably the genesis of the sitcom. Silly characters doing silly things and not growing or changing in any way. I'm done! The last 10% I was skimming more and more and more and all the footnotes to 13th century chivalric texts. Now, there were a couple chapters that the format completely changed and it was an embedded story about some tragic love story or something and those were much more interesting but there was no way I was going to keep going for however many hundred pages so I'm done. Another notch on my belt. Another classic text that I bailed on. So those were my bails. So now let me tell you about the four books that I finished for Read Your Shelves and that those four plus this one which I talked about last week were the five that I finished to complete the top row. I will put the crossword puzzle back up just for Southern Biscuits to enjoy. The first one is a novel from the Slovenian part of Austria, Angel of Oblivion by Maja Haderlap, published in English in 2016, translated by Tess Lewis. This was a five-star read, my third five-star read of the month. And I loved it, despite some notable flaws, which, no matter how critically I read, would not budge me off a five-star love for this book. So, Mata Haderlap is an Austrian-Slovenian writer. She grew up in... Uh, another term for that part of Austria is the Corinthian enclave, or ethnic minority within Austria, which is now abuts the Slovenia, the border with Slovenia, which was a country that didn't exist until about less than 20 years ago or something, I can't remember, but fairly recently. Um, it's never been clear to me, and maybe Britta can help me out, whether she wrote this in German or wrote it in Slovenian, because she writes in both languages. Oh, I guess it looks like a German title. Angel der Vergessens. 
uh, in 2012. So that I guess she wrote it in German. And this is a heavily autobiographical novel about a young woman growing up in what seemed to be maybe the 1960s in the countryside of the Slovenian part of Austria with a father, with parents, but a fa with a father and a grandmother totally traumatized by the brutality of what they endured in World War II. Now, I haven't done a lot of research. I want to do more research. But what I understand is, in terms of when Hitler took over Austria, and all during the Nazi occupation of Austria and during World War II, the only, or the primary resistance and armed resistance to that occupation was from the Slovene Austrians. And they were called partisans. Now, I may not have that correct, but that was my understanding just from reading this book and a little bit on Wikipedia. Anyway, this young woman, she's about 10 or 11 when the story opens, I believe, and her father is so psychologically wounded with classic PTSD stuff. He's suicidal, he's an alcoholic, uh, and otherwise, you know, tries to be a good family man and works very hard on the farm and doing logging or something like that in the forest. But he's just a deeply wounded man. The girl's grandmother, this her father's mother, she actually went to the camps. So her husband, who's dead in the present of the story, had been a partisan. And because of that, she got dragged to Ravensbrook and was there for years. She has dealt with her trauma a lot better than her son. That's all I'll say about the story. The characters were, I think I'm going to do a full review, the characters were incredibly vivid, especially the father and the grandmother. The grandmother, she has a lot of folk cures for this, that, and the other thing, mental illnesses and physical problems, physical uh, illnesses, and she comes across as just a really open, loving, fun, and uh, irrepressible survivor. I absolutely loved her. She's a strong contender for my favorite character of 2019. There were things about it, I thought, in places the, the, trans, the writing or the translation was uneven. There was some breathtakingly beautiful descriptions of people and places and emotions, but there was also, I felt the less successful part of the novel was the protagonist as she grows up and becomes an adult and becomes a writer. The writing about that and the navel-gazing about all that, the reinvention type kind of writing, was uh, quite clunky in places and not a joy to read. But none of that budged me off. Uh, absolutely loving this book, and I recommend it extremely highly. I also finished Houseboy by Ferdinand Oyono. Yesterday's vlog, I kept saying Ayono, but it's Oyono. Ferdinand Oyono, a Cameroonian writer who later became a diplomat, and it was written in the 1950s, published in French in 1960, and then the English translation after that. English translation into English, 1966 by John Reed. I really like this novel. It started out really evocatively with a Cameroonian man visiting neighboring Spanish Guinea, which is now Equatorial Guinea, I believe, and them getting word that there was another Cameroonian in the village or nearby through some drum signals that was dying. And so they go through the night, through the woods or through the jungle or whatever, and to find him and... Uh, speak to him for just a few minutes before he dies. And then the Cameroonian guy in that first chapter is given this dead man's journals. And that forms the rest of the book. Now the journals were not nearly as literarily interesting as was that opening chapter, which was just gobsmackingly engaging. But it was still a really good novel. It wasn't a literary masterpiece like Achebe's Things Fall Apart or Watayongo's Weep Not child, but it was still a really engaging, powerful story about that guy who died. He was a houseboy for the white Frenchmen that had control of Cameroon at that time, and they treat him with murderous abuse. Yeah, a powerful story. I really liked it. I'm not going to repeat the rant that I gave on my vlog from, I believe it was Wednesday of this week. If you want to see me in full rant mode about this book, you can look it up. But I will tell you a little bit about what made me so angry. This is a novel from Colombia, Caroline, Carolina Sanin's The Children, translated from the Spanish by Nick Caster, and published in English 2017, I believe. This was the replacement cover by, and while I didn't bail on this, and I'm glad that I f finished it, 
uh, I was deeply disappointed by the end because it was sailing at a, at a five star read uh, right until the penultimate chapter. So, in a nutshell, this rather unusual middle -a single middle aged Colombian woman finds a boy outside her house one night and then takes care of him. And the story's not that simple, there's a bunch of bureaucratic stuff, but she is basically given, eventually given custody of him. And he's a little bit odd too, but the connection between them is fascinating. And the writing, the translation was just gorgeous. I loved it. And you know, they're both unusual people and he doesn't want to talk about, he doesn't, he's seven years, six years old, I think when she finds him. He won't talk about or doesn't remember anything about his past. And the story gets weirder, but in a really emotionally compelling way. And I was just carried along by the writing and the images of the whales and the, way, the stories they told each other. And he was just not adorable in a TV, in a Disney movie way, but he was really quirky. And they were both so fully developed. Like she was kind of like out of a Barbara Pym novel. And <laughs> I, it was um, sometimes amusing, uh, often very moving, and then he gets, his behavior becomes a little weirder at the end, and so she goes and looks up an astrologer that she'd had one consultation with two decades, oh, the rat's coming, I can't control it, and he, <laughs> that she'd had one consultation with two decades before, and there's a fucking 20 page chapter about all the Looney Tunes bullshit the astrologer tells her about the boy or about her, and uh, it ruined the novel. But because I had enjoyed it so thoroughly up until that penultimate chapter, I still gave it three stars. But what a hokey, ridiculous, fucked up, infuriating ending! I also finished <laughs> Haruki Murakami's South of the Border, West of the Sun. And this was first published in English about 1998, I think. Four star read. I quite enjoyed it. I... This is, as I said in yesterday's vlog, this is the first Murakami I have read since I became aware of how many women don't like his books and don't like his female characters. And so I was reading it, really paying close attention to that, and I can see that critique very much in this book. And I now have a working theory that I will be testing as I continue to read more Murakami, both rereading stuff I've had read years ago or reading new stuff, that th there's the, always this aura of mystery about the women. They are inscrutable, they're unknowable, and are they actually here, or are they a figment of the protagonist's imagination, or do they exist on another planet, or all that stuff, right? That I like that woozy, what's this? But I also now have a working theory that it's because Murakami can't really get himself in, get his imagination inside the, the head or the soul of a woman, that he makes them all mysterious so he doesn't have to even try! So very much was thinking that, and it was pissing me off in places. The protagonist was a sexy jerk. It's a sex, there was one sex scene. The climactic sex scene was pretty hot. But mostly because of the woman and what she wanted to do. So no thanks to him, except that obviously he was the kind of guy that she and maybe myself might want to do those things to. But, um... I have to say that I thought the ending was emotionally powerful in a way that really confronted the protagonists and maybe Murakami's own obtuseness about women head on in what the wife confronts her husband about at the end. It really worked for me so that uh, made it a four star read so I, I enjoyed it. Those are the four books that I finished this week. So now, moving on to, I have started one book this morning, okay? So that's Slave Old Man by Patrick Chamoiseau, a Martinique, Martinician, Mart Mart Martinician, I don't know what that demonym would be, is that the right word, demonym? Canada, Canadian, Martinique, Martinican? Let's check that out right now, shall we? Martiniquan or Martinique, it must be French. Martiniques, or oh, those would be French, male and female. I will stick with Martinican. So, Patrick Chamoiseau is a Martinican writer. And I just read the first chapter. This is uh, for Black History Month. I'm doing this as a buddy read with Justin of Ghost Reader. We haven't checked in with each other. I, we're going to do four chapters today and three chapters tomorrow. It's a short little novella. I read the first chapter and I was really wowed by it, but also felt that the, it's overwritten. It's really 
heavy, laden with adverbs and adjectives and alliteration that I don't like. But the story, other parts of the writing I absolutely love and I was just pulled, sucked right in deeply. I'm still in that story, so I can't wait to get back to it today. I'll read three more chapters. A little bit worried about that overwriting. On Sunday, I'm going to start a group buddy read of Zora Neale Hurston's debut novel, Jonah's Gourd Vine. And this is with, let's see if I can remember everybody. This is with Doris of Aldi Books, Justin of Ghost Reader. Chris Wallach, who says she's coming on to BookTube. I hope she will someday. But she's co-host of the fabulous bookish podcast, The Book Cougars. And Karen of Run Right Reads. So it's a fabulous group to be buddy reading this with. And we're going to start that and read it over about 10 days, maybe. So I'm really stoked about that. Today I also think I'm going to start the book of poetry that I have chosen for Black History Month. The Collected Poems of County Cullen. I found out about this because Steve Donahue read one of Cullen's poems on his Poetry Newbie tag video, and I fell in love with it, and so I could get the whole 335-page collected poetry from Apple Books for like $3 or something. So I'm going to start reading those today. And Karen of Run Right Reads and I will be buddy reading this work of history, Almost Home. The subtitle is Maroons Between Slavery and Freedom in Jamaica. Nova Scotia and Sierra Leone by Ruma Chopra. So this is about a group of escaped slaves that are exiled from their native Jamaica in 1795. They were known as the Trelawney Town Maroons and they then went on to Nova Scotia and eventually Sierra Leone. And I was introduced to the historical phenomena of the Maroons, the civilizations that form when slaves successfully escape their masters and form their own culture. And that the historical term is Mar the Maroons. And I want to tease out what, what's the connection between that and being marooned. I'm very curious to, because I know absolutely nothing. There was a footnote. I think it was Zora Neale Hurston did some anthropological work on that when she was in Haiti or somewhere like that. So Karen and I will be buddy reading this in the first half of February. I can't wait. Probably read, read a few pages at least today. And I might also start one of the other novels on my Black History EBR, but I'll play that by ear. I'm thinking if I do, it will be the one by another female writer from the Harlem Renaissance, Jesse Redman Fawcett, Plum Bun. And that is about a light-skinned African-American woman who leaves her black neighborhood in Philadelphia and comes to New York City and passes as white. Plum Bun originally published in 1928. I might try to get that one started this week as well. So that's what's going on for me. It's going to be a fabulous week one of Black History Month. That's what's going on here. What's going on there? Thanks for watching.